Hi, David Weizard here, and you are watching Paratech 10. Give me a few moments of your time, and I will give you the benefit of over 60 years of building high performance and race winning engines. So what's on the agenda for today? You may well have noticed that one of our primary concerns is getting the most for the least, that is the most horsepower reliably, for the least amount of cash uh, spent. Now, I've had quite a few people ask me, what can we get without spending a fortune on cylinder heads? And when I say a fortune, I'm talking about thousand dollars up. That's for a complete cylinder head. So to address this, I thought, well, let's see what's possible out of a stock head. And what prompted me there is I was going through some power curves that I did back in the 80s with a head just like this one here. And that is a, one of the closed chamber 186 style castings, right? They, they were the preferred high performance castings back in their day. And it was a, a engine I built for cylinder head testing, you know, where I just modified this and modified that just a little bit at a time to see what effects it had on power. And I looked at the final results and I thought, wow, um, these are pretty good. Uh, we were looking at something in the region of uh, just shy of 380 horsepower and 442 foot pounds. Now, all of this came together in a, um, how shall I say, a, an idea. I'm at the moment with my friend Sean, we're building a 350 cubic inch engine that will be for his Model A. Now these Model A's don't weigh very much, I mean typically around 2200 pounds. And uh, so the thing is, is we don't need huge amounts of horsepower to move surplus mass. They don't s simply don't have it. So I thought, well, looks as much as anything are important on this. And of course, since the car is not a Model A styled Corvette, uh, outright performance is not going to be an issue. Sure, we're going to have it with modern brakes on it and suspension, not for looks, but for handling and cornering. Right, so I thought to myself, let's have a look and see what we can get on a, a, a near stock 350 Chevy with just absolutely stock heads and we just change the cam the intake manifold and put a suitable carb on it right now that's not a high dollar bill I mean could do all of that under a thousand dollars right now the, I'm going to show you the power curves that we got in about 1986 for this but our new build has got some upgrades these have come about through modernization. For instance, uh, the bottom end, which by the way, was built for us by um, my uh, good friend, Jim Wright of Motorheads up in, I put the address across the bottom. Right now, Jim, I've known Jim a long time now, like probably coming up for 20 years. And, uh, um, He's into uh, hot rods. Uh, so I asked him to build a short block because there's not much mileage in me building a short block here. So that he kindly did in uh, exchange for some favors for me to do for him. And we're going to use it as a cam and cylinder head test engine before it goes into the uh, Sean's Model A. Before we get too far into this uh, low buck 350 Chevy expose, 
I need to tell you something up front. So that, and the, the point is that I don't want this uh, gold to be lost in all the data and small moves to increase power on a rebuild that I'm going to give you. The essence of this uh, build is that we take note of the numbers 107 and 108. That's the lobe center line angle we must have our cam on if we're going to build a stock headed 350 small block Chevy with a compression ratio of between about 9.5 and, and 10.5 and to 1. Right. Remember that number and you're good to go. Now, let's say you want to do this on an absolute budget. Then if you've got a small block Chevy that's in good condition, uh, if it's a roller cammed block, then you can upgrade that cam for a cost as little as about $80. If it's a flat tappet cam, well, you need to be looking at a cam from Howard's that's guaranteed, a flat tappet cam that's guaranteed not to go flat, or a cam from Comp that's hardened. Don't go in any, anywhere else. If the cam's very m much more aggressive than stock, you'll need to go with this, the Stellite faced lifters. So, for about the price of a gasket set, a lot of hard work, and a cam on 107 or 108 lobe centerline angle that's streetable, you can increase the power output by about 60 or 70 horsepower and bump the torque up by 60 foot pounds. That's well worth having. Well, Here's the heads we're using. I got these heads uh, from uh, uh, Terry Walters, right? He has got a, uh, a deal where he takes a, when he tears cylinder heads down, he takes a look to see what kind of condition they're in. If they're worn out, he'll throw them away. But he had these set of heads here, which uh, the, um, from the oil in them, it looked like they had regular oil changes and uh, so I got these heads checked them out and the guides and seats do not need any work other than just clean them up and lap the valves in now the valves I didn't have the valves so I use for stock rebuilds I use these SBI valves right which are not a lot of money they're Chinese made they work pretty well okay they're not going to withstand huge power outputs i haven't had any problems with them but um you know i i wouldn't use them in engines over about 400 horsepower uh, unless it was for the drag strip and the mileage wasn't an issue anyway we're going to use those valves in there just lap in the seats uh, uh, and uh, clean the heads up now when i say clean the heads up what i'm going to do here is detail the exterior Right, I'm going to leave the valve stock. I'm not going to back cut them or anything like this. I'm going to put this all together and just detail the heads in terms of taking flash marks off and things like this and painting them a nice color, etc. Uh, etc. Et now, here's the block that uh, Jim Wright so kindly did for us it's, uh, it's a roller cam block, you can tell by the spider hold down. Uh, uh, positions here and of a point here if you want to go with a roller cam block and you got it with a roller cam in it a stock roller cam read the contact that goes across the bottom of the page this is a guy that will reprofile your stock cam right for a lot less money than you can buy one and uh, uh, at this stage there is no downside to it um, the other thing is these Marley pistons they have the slight uh, uh, deshrouding lean on them here which is good they use a one millimeter ring they're coated skirt or say a one millimeter that's one one and three right they are the latest design as of about three years ago so 
that is up to the date. Jim finished the block off by putting all the uh, plugs in it. And this is the one you never want to forget, right? I did that once, had to take all the heads off and everything off this side. Haven't put the cam in yet, uh, but that's gonna go in shortly. Now a few words on dampers. There's plenty of pretty decent aftermarket dampers. Uh, the one that I'm going to recommend here is uh, the stock 8 inch 400 small block damper. Right? This is the heaviest and largest diameter damper out there. Right? And if you are going to use a stock damper, the engine will run smoother and will make slightly more power on that bigger damper. This is not my uh, guesswork here. I've dyno tested it so that I know. Uh, one more point as well. The connecting rods. These are the late model connecting rods in here. That's the uh, 5.7 inch long powder metallurgy rods that are very strong. So this bottom end here, although it's not for a particularly high output engine. It's good to 7500. Just to make sure I covered them, I'd like to quickly go through some details here. Uh, as a recap, we've uh, covered the crank damper, right? Remember the uh, 8 inch damper seems to work best on here so long as it's internally balanced. Now you can take an external balance damper and machine out the bit in the middle that offsets it. Cam. Let's look at the cam. Uh. There's not a lot of difference. It, for a like speck of cam, the uh, roller cam is not going to deliver any more valve area, opening area, than the flat tappet cam. It could be close, but certainly at 270 degrees of duration, the flat tappet cam almost certainly is going to deliver better power. When you're specking the cam out here, it's important to make sure that the one entity that is absolutely essential when using heads like this to get the best out of them is to use them on the right lobe center line angle. Here's the deal. If you turn out to use a roller cam, put them on a 107 degree lobe center line angle. If you're using a flat tappet cam, 108. When it comes to rockers, you can get away with the stock rockers, so long as there is not a wear, severe wear pattern on the tip. If there is and you're good at dressing things up with a file and sandpaper, you can fix it. I've done it many a times, but I'm pretty damn good with a file, that's for sure. And I've only done it just for a dyno test. Uh, with good oil in it and I know it's going to last the dyno test without any appreciable change. However, you should be aware that the stock rockers, although they're advertised at 1.5, are very rarely anywhere near that. About 1.44 to about 1.46 is more normal. Now, some replacement rockers are a better deal than that. If I'm going to replace some rockers, I will use the crane ones or the PRW ones because the stock ones 
that is the stock 1.5 ones are much nearer 1.5 in fact if I remember rightly both of those are a bit over 1.5 something like 1.52 however you're better off with 1.6 rockers right and since the cam that I'm going to recommend is probably a single pattern or only just slightly more exhaust timing than intake a set of 1.6s all round will work and the two brands that I recommend the two types I recommend here are from PRW and they're as follows the first of my PRW rocker recommendations is a low buck item it's for a 3.8 stud it's nitro hardened and it has the extended slot for higher lift cams our second PRW rocker is a cast stainless rocker with a roller tip. These are very robust. They have extremely good off the seat ratio, which is good for power output. Right, intake manifold. Again, we're dealing with a street motor here. Edelbrock Performer air gap works extremely well here having said that it works extremely well with a carburetor which atomizes the fuel well without the necessary heat pad that most manifolds have so when you put a carburetor on make sure that it is not a straight leg booster um, two carbs I can recommend here the 650 vacuum secondary Holly or a 650 vacuum secondary uh, quick fuel carburetor, right? Both of those will work very well. So stick to stick to one or other of those. Now here's a low buck uh, valve spring I can recommend here. This spring, in spite of the fact of only costing uh, a little over two and a half bucks, uh, works very well. Uh, With 110 pounds on the seat, it will handle about 525 lift. Um, so that's the target that you should uh, not exceed um, if you're going to use this spring. This actual spring is a PBM 3000 and it's available from Urson or you can probably get this from Jegs or Summit as it's a fairly uh, widely used spring there. Oh, by the way, this is a one and a quarter inch diameter spring. It will fit into the pockets, valve pockets fine and uh, it will uh, it can run with a stock um, um, retainer the rockers um, I would advise the uh, um, stock rockers can be used with this but the PRW um, car steel rockers part number will go across the bottom here uh, work very well but again limit your uh, lift to about 525 if this is the spring you're going to use if you use the high lift rockers uh, instead of the stock 1.5s the lobe center line angles that I quoted for both the flat tap and the roller need to be widened about one degree so and I think that's it so let's look at the uh, uh, detailing on the um, uh, cylinder head itself here we go because these heads are primarily intended to go on a low buck street rod motor, uh, I did some detailing on the uh, uh, head castings to uh, just make them look that much 
nicer. Flash mark taken off here, rounded off nicely, right here and here. This was properly shaped here. The flash marks on the castings were cleaned down to the base surface and the uh, other end of the casting was cleaned up and here a couple of detail bits on the end of the casting but you should get the point from that here I'm masking up the cylinder head the first thing I'm going to do is to paint this with electric armature paint here. I'll put the source of this across the bottom the reason that I'm painting this is that this head has been shot blasted so I'm going to seal in the casting just just in case there's anything left from the blasting process shouldn't be I've washed it very thoroughly but I never take a chance on that one thing I should say is a thick coat on here is not what you want you need to fog this on so uh, let's get to this masking process to mask the bolt face I just put an appropriate size washer on there for the spring seat it's just a similar technique to the uh, bolt holes just put a, a spacer under it now we do need to mask the tops of the valve stems uh, so that uh, we don't get paint on there because it's not good for putting on the and getting the best grip from the oil stem seals so here I've got an old valve stem seal so just push that on there and it covers up the relevant parts right if you don't have a valve stem seal hey you're gonna have to mask it as for the studs you need only mask the threads themselves right a little paint on the rest of it is not going to hurt anything in particular right there we go just continue and do the whole lot like that and we're ready then ready to paint the uh, interior of the cylinder head okay time for a dab of paint when it comes to this uh, electric enamel paint you need only fog it on right a couple of light coats like this right first coat on let that dry well here's one of our heads all finished painted the uh, red enamel there was fogged on about four coats over a period of a day in other words I left it for about two or three hours sitting on a radiator to make sure it wasn't ice cold you know it's about a hundred degrees when the head was when both heads were done with the uh, in, uh, electric uh, enamel they were put on a radiator at a temperature of about 150 and left for four or five days for it to cure it's now hard this here is a primer then about three coats of color well it's valve seat grinding time so let me uh, just quickly guide you through this first off do not use coarse lapping paste. If you have to use coarse lapping paste to get a pattern around here, that's because your valve seat is out. Now I'll tell you something about valve lapping, right? It is not ultra accurate. If you use a coarse paste, you can make almost any seat, even up to about five thousands out, uh, show a, a pattern right so use fine stuff uh, I'm using this Permatex uh, water based one here um, uh, it works pretty good but there's a little problem with it you need to know about right uh, it 
if you just wipe it off after you've lapped the valve in, next day you'll find the seat rusty. So you will need to WD-40 it down. Now let's have a look at the pattern we've cut here. Well, the valve has lapped in perfectly. And the seat is showing a similar pattern there. So that is good, up to a point. But we're not done. We've got to check to see that it is actually sealing. So this is how we do that. Now to make sure we've lapped our valves in properly, we're going to need some of this Prussian blue. As simple an operation as this is, I've seen it done incorrectly, grossly incorrectly, on at least two YouTube videos. Now what we're going to do here is, well let me tell you what I saw done wrong. It was ladled on so that the blue was thick, like this. Now, think about this. If I were to put this valve into that now, that blue is so thick that it would blue the seat up, regardless of how accurate it is. So what we actually need to do is to take off most of it until we have just a smear on there. It should literally just be discoloring the seat. Now, because the seat's been ground in already, you'll see that dark streak, but basically this is this blue is just a tenth or so thick on here, right? I've wiped off most of it. Now, at this point, I can stick it in here and check to see if the seat blues up. Shouldn't need much action to do that. Let's see how that's looking there. Perfect. Let me show you a close-up. Before going on, I'd like to make a point here. If you are going to rebuild a set of heads like this for your hot rod, a regular rebuild or whatever, then there's more power to be had by back cutting the valves and cutting an angle at the bottom of the seats. You'll see where that is when you blew them up. You'll see the seats rather wide. The reason I'm not doing that is I need, for the purposes of seeing the differences, a set of absolutely near perfect stock heads. No modifications. Well here we are, all the valves lapped in and checked with blue. Now it's time to do the springs. We're now at the stage where we can uh, start to measure the installed heights on the springs. With the stock seats and the stock length valves, they're all pretty consistent. I ran through them all and with no spring spacers underneath the valves, these uh, springs that I'm recommending work out between 110 and 115. Installed height here is 8.650. 8.7 is uh, 110, so this one's a little over. Now you may not have one of these, this is from Comp, but you can do it instead of using this to hold the valve in place you use a light spring and you measure the distance underneath the retainer with this and then check it with the uh, caliper it's possible to get within five thousand which is plenty accurate enough for the job first job when assembling cylinder heads is to make sure that the valve stems and the guides are properly lubricated and grease is the best deal for the job here. First you grease it and put it through on the installed side, then remove it, 
take off the excess grease on the stem at the bottom part and then we're going to do the same thing but from the other side of the head just to make sure it's all nicely lubed. Just put the exhaust in here. Right. Okay, now time to turn it over. Turn the head over like so. Regrease the valves and slot them all through like this. They should now be adequately lubed. And by the way, I, I use a, lith a high temperature lithium grease here to get the job done. As that stays on the job longer. With all the valves in place, put plenty of grease on prior to installing the uh, oil seals. What we're going to do here is we're going to trap a fair amount of grease so that the initial lubrication is well taken care of. We're going to trap it between the top of the guide and the oil stem seal. Next move, install the oil stem seals. Right. Note the seals, the type of seal I'm using. You don't need to put a uh, sleeve on, right, because the seal is far from delicate. So we go all down here until we've got all the stem seals in place. Just to be sure they're all seated, give them a light tap like this just to uh, bottom out the seals so that they're in their correct position. Well, we are at the assembly stage here, and this all may look a little different to what you may expect. Normally, I would be using my goods and spring compressor to install the springs and retainers. However, arthritis is overruling that, so I'm using what can be best be described as a gross overkill of a spring compressor here. Let me just zoom back here and you'll see what I mean milling machine right so back to our focus here first move put grease on the end of the valve stem like so next take the spring that you're going to install just grease the bottom of it lightly place it over the valve then take the retainer make sure it's spotlessly clean we don't want any grit in there and place that in position like so now here's where we differ from just using a regular spring compressor this tool here is a snug fit over the retainer and just shy of pressing on the spring. Position it like so and compress the spring. Now the nice thing about this is you can manipulate it at this point. A retainer and valve all concentric. Right, next thing, compress it, lock it in place and now it all stays put now so that we can install the keepers. Here we go, one keeper in. Like so, the other keeper in. And there you have it. And here, is what our finished head looks like. Well, there you have it. Hopefully I've given you at least 10 moves that are rarely, if ever, 
talked about, like the damper, like the booster in the carburetor, etc. So, if you liked what you saw, please subscribe, like, comment, and share. Now, one last point here. You will see Marvin's name in the credits here. This is the one before the last video that he participated in. I'm doing the credits in a moment and I will be putting his name in, in black, in remembrance to what a great partner he was. Thank you for watching.